Hello, my name is Matt Foy. I'm a salmon habitat restoration biologist that spent my career working throughout the Chilliwack River watershed. This presentation came about from a conversation I had with Grace Kelly of Suali, and it's related to these Chinook salmon that spawn downstream of Chilliwack Lake, Scottsdale and perhaps even above Chilliwack Lake. They're a small population. Uh, nobody is counting or watching over them, but I think they have an important place in our history here in Skushtemu. And I think this story is worth telling, and I hope some people find the story interesting and perhaps think about what they might be able to do to help these Chinook salmon that should not be forgotten. So here's a picture of one of these Chinooks that I'm going to tell the story about. And I've called it Scutzakel Chinook. And part of the story will be letting people know why that name might be appropriate. Why is it not called Chinook, uh, Chilliwack River Chinook Salmon? It is, but for people that don't know, there's actually three unique populations of Chinook Salmon in the Chilliwack River. And only one of them is native to that river, and that's the Scotsakel Chinook. Now, if you look at the genetic structure of Fraser River Chinook, in fact, this population of fish is not recognized. It is believed to be gone. And I don't believe that. And I'll tell you why. This is part of this story. And it's part of passing on the information to others so they can think about what's important to conserve for the future. And I believe Scots and Cal Chinook are important to conserve and recognize for the future. So for people that don't know the history, the fisheries and oceans fisheries officer's job up to the 1980s, going back decades, was to count salmon in the fall. And they would put in a record, a written record, an estimate of the number of fish in a stream. So for the Chilliwack River, they reported in 1947, 400 Chinook salmon. In 1957, they, they showed 400 Chinook salmon. The highest number I see in the records was in 1951 when they recorded 1,500 Chinook salmon. But by the 1970s, they were showing 125, 150, and the last note was in 1979 with 50 Chinook salmon. What does that tell us? That Scotsakel Chinook were always few in number, but they persisted over many, many, many decades. Now, looking back farther in history, many First Nations, Skokel included, I believe, have first salmon ceremonies. Historically, when there was fisheries in the Chilliwack River, particularly weir fisheries, it is likely some of the very first salmon caught in the season were these Chinook salmon. Scotscow Chinook salmon are believed to enter the river in the spring, in the early spring, some of them, perhaps as early as February and March, there is a uh, taxidermy mount of a Chinook salmon in the Chilliwack Fish and Game Club uh, uh, halfway up the valley that shows it was caught in May. So these Chinook salmon appear to migrate in the river when the river is relatively high in the spring melt. And where do they go? They go upstream. And why, why does Scutzakel uh, Chinook uh, relate to them so well. They live and exist because the presence of Chilliwack Lake. Chilliwack Lake 
protects them from the worst of the floods and it provides them a refuge both as adults and juveniles in fact to stay in the lake during the worst of the heat of summer or perhaps the floods of winter so their population primarily spawns downstream of the lake as far down perhaps slightly below Nasakwatch Creek and I'll show a little map a little later and there is rumors they in fact go upstream from Chilliwack Lake into the upper Chilliwack River some people know it as Dolly Varden Creek and I'll talk about that a little bit more this is a unique population of fish that has existed since well we'll talk time immemorial and probably entered the valley when the Chilliwack River flowed into the Nooksack River where its relations still exist in the North Fork Nooksack and the South Fork Nooksack and it's my belief that these fish are genetically linked to their relations in that watershed and came into the valley probably almost 10,000 years ago and for that reason should not be forgotten. So as we've discussed, the Skutkasel Chinook were well known to the fishery officers who made these annual estimates. Now, just to be fair, these estimates truly were just estimates. They, they weren't counts per se, but it's likely the Chinook runs over the decades the fishery officers recorded uh, spawners probably numbered in most years in the hundreds of individuals perhaps in a good year even over a thousand spawners may have returned to the upper river first nations would have valued these fish primarily because they were the very first salmon of the season and were the basis of many of their rituals celebrating the return to salmon to their river but the other community that valued and celebrated these fish was the angling community. I talked to Dave Barnes, a longtime angler of the Chilliwack River, who actually grew up fishing these, these Chinook salmon. And his recollection were that the fishery began in May before the majority of snow melt. Uh, some fish were caught. And then as the river came up high and then started to drop, the major fishery occurred later in June and early July. Again, it was a privilege and honor to land one of these beautiful and rare fish, even in those days. So we have the three communities, the researchers, First Nations and anglers, all valuing highly this population. And I think knowing that history is important for people today to ask the question should we not be valuing this population and ensuring its long-term conservation into the future so i've put a link on to a research paper where you can find a really a deep science discussion about the genetic origins of Chinook salmon in the Fraser River watershed. It's only for the brave at heart. It's very technical. But if you did read this report, you would find that the Chilliwack River is listed as supporting two populations of Chinook salmon only. One of them came from the Harrison River it was first incubated at the nearby Chehalish River hatchery in uh, approximately the 1990s. And it was moved then to the Chilliwack River hatchery and now released there. It's the fall whites that come in relatively late and they are genetically linked and part of what we call the lower Fraser fall run, which is dominated by the Harrison River. They, they survive because they are produced by the hatchery. And for various reasons, they may spawn in nature in the Chilliwack River, but they make choices that probably aren't great for their survival. And if the hatchery was not there and did not continue to produce Chinook salmon of this group, it's likely over a number of years, it might take a decade, they would slowly decline and disappear from the river. They're a fully hatchery supported run they're the fall whites.
and they're the most numerous Chinook in the river. The second group of Chinook in the Chilliwack River are sometimes called the Summer Reds. If you read this paper, they originally came from the Slim Creek Bowron system up in the upper Fraser River. And they were brought down to the Chilliwack Hatchery in the 1980s. And they were incubated and released to replace the Chinook that were no longer there, the Scotsakel. It was hoped they would return in the summer, early. They're a red-fleshed Chinook. And I think most people know they're the fishery that the anglers target in the uh, summertime. And also, more recently, the Sumas First Nation has been attempting to harvest them in the lower river. These are called Chilliwack Reds. The other ones are called Chilliwack Whites. They both exist in the river. They both spawn in the river. But in case of the uh, Chilliwack Reds, they spawn quite early, in fact, too early in, in, in the summer to be effective. Their fry come out in the middle of the winter, so they don't survive. The Harrison Whites choose the big brawling river below Celesi Creek, like the big river they came from, the Harrison. But anyone knows the river below Celesi Creek. It floods and gravel moves around, and these Chinook would then be very vulnerable to be washed out during the winter floods. So again, both these populations exist because the majority of fish we see return each to year are produced from those released each year from the hatchery. A portion returning have spawned in nature, but without the hatchery support, they would soon disappear, which leaves us the Scotskakel Chinook. Do they exist? I think so, and I'm going to tell you a story why I think so. So before we leave this picture of Scotskakel Chinook, and to my knowledge, it may be the only picture that exists. A couple things to notice. If you're a fisherman and you catch a lot of Chinook salmon, have a look at the cheek plate, the gill plate of this fish, and notice the quite heavy spotting. From my experience, that is not common. This is somewhat unique feature. And the second thing I want to point out is you'll see just at the base of the gill plate two little holes. And that's where they use a hole punch, just what you would use for a piece of paper. And that's how they collect genetic samples, showing this fish was sampled for its genetics. So what I know is there was a period that we actively looked for these Chinook in the late 1990s and the 2000s and we found them and we sampled them uh, genetic samples and they're in the DFO database however there was never enough samples taken to define them as a unique population they couldn't they didn't have enough samples but it doesn't mean the population doesn't exist so this is a key point these fish in my opinion survived decades of change in the watershed, whether it was heavy logging or fishing, all through the 20th century. And they only actually disappeared when we stopped looking for them. And I think this is the story that I would like to tell for others that might, in fact, think a little bit whether that is a good thing to stop looking for them, or should we try to find how many there is, where they spawn, so we can take care of them into the future. So here's a little sketch map of the Chilliwack River watershed, and some of the key places that I'll be talking about. So you can see at the left-hand corner, the Fraser River, and the Chinook salmon would swim into the river in the, in the lower end, which is actually called the Sumas River, and then turn left at the branch up the Vedder Canal into what then turns into the Vedder River. As they pass Swelcher Creek, you can see the approximate location of the Suwali community with the yellow star. 
So from a Chinook's perspective, a scout's cacao Chinook, think about they're migrating in that high water of May, potentially. They have lots of water to cover their tracks. There are very few fish. Nobody sees them. And as they move up the river a little farther, passing Tamahai Creek, on either side of the river, if you know that section of the river, is large clay slides that we'll talk a little bit about in the uh, next slides. And they, I think, affect why these fish go so far upstream. A little farther is that red line. That's the angling, angling boundary. So there is no angling above there. So the Chinook, once they cross the red line, are largely protected from anglers and other fisheries. The red star is the location of the Chilliwack River hatchery, which is just above the confluence of Slessy Creek. And if you know Slessy Creek, Slessy Creek itself is a very high energy stream with lots of landslides and gravel moving down into the lower Chilliwack River. Very relatively unstable stream. You go a little farther up and you run into where you go through this, the mini canyon. There's a short canyon between Slessy Creek and Chipmunk Creek or Foley Creek. There's a canyon section, deep, dark water, places you could hold if you were large fish in the summertime. And finally, as you move above Foley Creek and you start approaching the Saxhua Creek, the river has some gravel bars and some side channels become, but becomes much more stable, particularly above the Sackwatch Creek. And as you pass Center Creek, it becomes even more stable, where there's patches of gravel and boulders. And finally, you enter Chilliwack Lake. And at the lake outlet, shown in the little green start is a large bed of gravel that was placed in the 1990s that I'll talk a little bit more about. Now if you're a Scotskakal Chinook, you may hold in the lake in the summer in the cool depths and you stay away from predators like otters or you may hold in those deep pools below Chilliwack Lake hidden perhaps under log jams. Or perhaps even in that canyon down just downstream from Foley Creek. If you come up in May, these fish won't be spawning until mid-September. So they have to protect themselves for those months. So they have to find those protected areas. And one of the impacts we think that made these fish less abundant was during the logging phase, the large wood in the Chilliwack River below Chilliwack Lake was no longer being recruited to the river as the forest became younger after logging. And those logs, large log jams that protected those fish in the summertime were not there. So they had to find new areas to hide out. And they probably were more vulnerable to things like otters during the summertime. And finally, I just want to point out, there's no confirmation that Chinook salmon of this population, the Scotskakal Chinook, spawn in that upper river that flows into the upper Chilliwack Lake. But if you know that river, it is an unlogged wilderness river that is beautiful habitat for salmon and supports, in some years, tens of thousands spawning sockeye salmon and perhaps thousands of spawning coho salmon. So it's very likely that Scotskakal Chinook salmon are with them too but they're rare and they're mixed in in a wilderness and we don't know where they spawn and how many but it's likely they're there and it's just because we don't look this is the chilliwack watershed we'll talk a little bit more about it so why do the scots cathal chinook go up to the upper watershed when there's so much good spawning gravel in the lower river so this is a picture of the Veda River, not too far downstream from Suwali. But from the years I worked on the Veda River Gravel Management Committee, I know in big floods, up to 50,000 cubic meters of gravel will move into this area from upstream reaches during these large flood years. This gravel is stable when we have a quiet winter, but if we get early snows, like we are now in 2021 up in the mountains, 
and the snowpack starts to build and then we get a very very warm what they call an at atmosphere at river today but we used to call the pineapple express then a big flood occurs i remember the big floods of 1989 and 1990 they both occurred in and around uh, remembrance day around november 10th and 11th and 9th and they were really large floods. All the gravel in this picture during those floods would have been moving. So fish that spawned here would have all died. The only fish that would have survived that flood were the ones that had went into the little side tributaries of the back channels on the floodplain. So over time, Scouts Cacao Chinook have found their place. They've moved beyond this gravel and they swim upstream. Past a number of features that they know from their historical uh, experience is the place for the safest place for this population to exist in the watershed. So this is just a picture of a nice fall flow in the Chilliwack River. At that road crossing, I think the local name is the Boulder Run. It's just above the Tamahai Confluence. So if you're a Chinook salmon from the summer red Chinook, that originally came from Slim Creek in the interior of British Columbia where they don't get big winter storms. Typically they spawn in the fall and the snow gets deep and it gets cold and the rivers actually drop. They're very, very stable. So their ecology suggests find a piece of gravel near where you were spawned and you'll be safe. So they spawn in this reach and the reaches all the way up to the Chilliwack Catchery and even farther. What about the Harrison River Chinook? The white Chinook now in the Chilliwack. The Chilliwack Whites. Well, they live in a big river below a big lake. The same thing. The Harrison Lake goes up and down slowly with the fall floods and releases the water gently down through the Harrison Rapids where the Harrison River Chinook spawn. They typically don't get the large floods of the more unstable streams like the Chilliwack. So when the Harrison Whites move through the Vedder River, a portion of them always will stop and spawn in those big beautiful gravel bars out in the middle of the Vedder River or a little farther upstream perhaps under this bridge and around this bridge if there was some gravel bars all the way up to the Chilliwack River Hatchew where most of them had come from but there's always a portion that come that had spawned a previous season but the message is both these populations have evolved in stable rivers and therefore they will use gravel when it's available now Scots Cacao has had 10,000 years of experience with the Chilliwack River and they don't spawn under this bridge they know this is not a safe place and how how can I describe that? How can we know it's not a safe place? I'll show you a picture. Notice the bridge deck and how high it is above the river. So this is the same bridge on a different day during one of those Pineapple Express floods. You can see the water is splashing at the bottom of the deck of the bridge. As I recall, the road was closed this time. They were uncertain if this bridge would hold. This perhaps could have been in the 1990 flood event. But the message was, if you were a Chinook salmon or any salmon that spawned in and around this bridge in the beautiful clean gravel that had been in a nice stable flow just perhaps a week before, all that gravel was moving. In fact, boulders were moving during this flood event. So all those little eggs that had spawned there were lost in this year. So what was the message? Scotscatel Chinook will move through this area, will pass beautiful, clean spawning ground, gra gravels on a bright fall day, but they know that this is not a place for them and is not a place of safety, unlike the two populations of Chinook salmon that now uh, exist in the Chilliwack River, but only survive by the actions of the hatchery. So this is just that little sketch map of the watershed, just to follow the, the, the journey of the Scots Cacao Chinook 
in the high water flows of May as they head upstream to their historic spawning grounds. So if you notice about mid-slide, you'll see Tamahai Creek. The last picture I showed you of the flood is where the road crosses the Chilliwack River just above Tamahai Creek. Now you'll notice there's a little orange star. There's a section of river that all the way up to Selesi Creek that is known for clay slides. And what are clay slides? I'll describe it later, but historically, the Chilliwack River in geological time, approximately 10,000 years ago, did not flow into the Fraser River. It flowed through Cultus Lake down into the Nooksack. Now, why did it do that? Because at that time, there was a large glacier part down what we call now Sumas Lake, a stranded portion of glacier left over from the glacial age. But because of that, to get the river as high as Cultus Lake, a good part of the lower Chilliwack River was a lake. And that's where these clay, clay banks came from. They were the bottom of a large glacial lake. When the glacier finally melted in Sumas Lake area, the Chilliwack River burst through what we call the, the, better, the better crossing, the narrowing of the river and burst out onto its floodplain and the river drained down, cutting through the old lake bed, leaving these hanging clay slides. Now, why is that important? Because these clay slides are naturally unstable. And periodically for the last 10,000 years, large portions of those clay slides have fallen down in the river and putting a lot of fine sediment into the spawning grounds downstream. It may not occur every, every decade, but every few decades we get a major slide. Again, Scotsakal Chinook have learned from their thousands of years history that this is not the place that they want to spawn to ensure that their young fry have the best chance of survival so they keep swimming upstream to higher in the watershed. This is just a screenshot from a very interesting document, a book that was produced a number of years ago, a Stolo Coast Stalish Historical Atlas. And this particular picture can be found on page 16. The little yellow star is where the Suwali community uh, is located today. And you can see there's a large piece of uh, glacier stranded in what's now called Sumas Lake area that effectively dammed the river up. The water could not flow through the better crossing. So the water would have been much deeper in the Chilliwack uh, River Valley in its lower section, and it would have been raised up to the elevation of the Cultus Lake or even higher, and then flowed through the Columbia Valley into then the then Nooksack River. So we, we, we know that in the Nooksack River, there's Chinook salmon populations in three of the major tributaries that are very similar in their ecology to the ones that exist. The Skutskakel Chinook of the Chilliwack River. There is a possibility that the relations of the Skutskakel Chinook are in fact not so much in the Fraser Valley, but in fact are in the Nooksack River Valley. And only f further genetic sampling of the Skutskakel Chinook will tell us that. But as we all know, uh, animals, people, and salmon were moving around at this time as valleys open up from deglaciation. And it just sort of highlights our common history in the Fraser Valley and how these ancient populations should be respected and protected into the future. For those that haven't been into that middle section of the Chilliwack River, just starting in the reach roughly uh, above Tamahai Creek and up to Selesi Creek, there's a series of these large faces of clay, and they're given names. In this case, this is called the Big Ptolemy Slide. And I don't know if you can see, but there's actual trees growing on this slide that are leaning over. They used to be at the top of the bank, but the bank, one winter's day, just fell down into the river, bringing all this fine sediment into the river. 
And it is these areas that have been doing this since the glacial uh, remnant melted in the Fraser Valley and the Chilliwack River burst out back to the Fraser River and cut deeply into the riverbeds, the old lake beds of these fine sediments. And these fine sediments have been slowly falling back into the river along the edges of the river in this section. The clay slides of the Chilliwack have been there since salmon have entered this part of the watershed and have affected populations like Scott Cassell Chinook, that they have evolved to move above and beyond this instability upstream, looking for more stable, safe places to spawn and rear. And I haven't mentioned that these Chinook salmon have an ecology that they spend a full year in the freshwater before they migrate to the ocean. And this means that they have to be very careful where they choose to spawn. So their little fry have the greatest chance of having a good, safe life in the river before they head down to the ocean one year later. So as the Skutskahal Chinook continues swimming upstream past the clay slides reach in the Chilliwack River and even clay slides in Celesi Creek that come to the river, they pass the Red Star, which is the Chilliwack River hatchery, and all of a sudden the river becomes quite different. Celesi Creek is a large input of coarse gravels during flood events, and as I mentioned, the clay slides add to this amount of material coming into the river. But as you move above Celesi Creek, you enter a section that's actually deep canyon, not the wide gravel bars of below Celesi Creek. And it's likely these canyon areas are important to Scotskakal Chinook. It's likely the number of them may spend their summer hiding in these deeper pools, trying to get away from their various predators. And it provides them safety as they migrate up in May and they don't spawn till late September. They have to survive for many months in the river. And it may be in this canyon area that many do. The challenge is finding them. In terms of us enumerating them, when they're hiding, they hide real well. So we can't really find them very easily. It's only when they move into their shallow spawning grounds can we visually see them and perhaps count them. But it's something to consider. This section of the watershed can be quite important for the survival of Scotskakel Chinook. And they've learned this over thousands of years. So this is just a picture of this section of canyon that it lies upstream from Celesi Creek and it goes roughly up to almost Foley Creek. This is likely a very important section for protecting the Chinook salmon of the upper Chilliwack River, Scottcatel Chinook. These deep pools provide them that depth of cover that keeps them away from mammal predators like otters, perhaps bird predators like ospreys, and possibly ourselves, people. We just cannot see them in these deep waters as they sit there many months through the summer, waiting to spawn in September. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the expected ecology of these Chinook. As we've described, they may come up in the high water of spring and very early summer and spend the summer wintering, probably in deep water, either associated with a large log jam or a canyon reach, effectively staying away from predators, potentially also in Chilliwack Lake itself. But somewhere in early September, they would start moving into a different phase where they're actually seeking out stable spawning areas. And often they do seek, in many rivers, Chinook salmon will seek lake outlets are, are very um, important areas for Chinook salmon, but also stable side channels often headed by large log jams. So this reach of the Chilliwack River from Foley Creek through past Nasaqua, Center Creek up to Chilliwack Lake was the key spawning ground that we know of for this group of fish. Now, historically, this would have had really large log jams that were permanent. They did not move. They might have been hundreds of meters in length. They still existed into the 70s. But the, this area had been logged very, very early and had a large fire in the 20s and 30s. So these log jams were slowly breaking down. 
and in fact were cleared in some of the phases for, for stream clearance activities. But these log jams are very, very likely important summer refuges for these Chinook salmon. And one of the one of the reasons that their numbers may have declined is these large jams largely disappeared in the late 20th century. So during the forest or BC forest renewal phase in the late 1990s, a site was identified to create a stable spawning ground, side channel spawning ground called Centennial Channel, and it was focused primarily at other species beyond Chinook. Although we were curious if Chinook would use it, I've showed it roughly with the red star. It's located on the south bank of the Chilliwack River between the center and the, the Sackwatch Creek, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. So if you go up to the Centennial side channel, you'll see this little signboard, and on the sideboard is a sketch of the project. It was uh, meant to provide a protected side channel type habitat for spawning salmon, spawning and rearing salmon. And it was originally focused on uh, supporting the pink salmon population of the upper Chilliwack River. And secondarily, it was designed to provide stream type uh, rearing habitat and spawning habitat for steelhead trout. A little later, a series of ponds were added over the, the, the phase, there was three phases to the project. It started in 96 and it completed in 1999. If you want a little bit uh, to know a little bit more about the project, what it did for the fish, uh, there was a report done on these types of projects in the Chilliwack R River Valley, off-channel habitat enhancement it's called, and I've provided a link on this slide. But again, as I discussed, the ecology of uh, Chinook salmon, the uh, Scotskill Chinook salmon, would be that as they move from their summer uh, summering grounds where they looked for deep cover either deep water or perhaps in a large stable log jam probably uh, late august very early september they began moving upstream and they would be looking for suitable spawning sites so the the classic spawning sites in uh, many rivers are lake outlets but also these stable side channels and often in nature when the chilliwack river was uh, undeveloped there would have been these large trees along the banks and as they had slowly fallen into the river they would create log jams that were largely stable they did not move very far even in the biggest floods they were just too big and there was too many logs and often they they dammed up the river and stable side channels would form off to the sides of these log jams and they would have log jams at their entrances so they were very very stable habitats so the centennial side channel was designed um, during the forest renewal program to replace many of these side channels that have been lost as these old log jams had slowly broken down after the watershed had been logged in the 20s and 30s and a big uh, big fire went through so anyway when we had built the channel uh, as expected pink salmon moved in quickly and chum salmon and coho salmon and steelhead trout but surprisingly, we, we noticed two populations, two waves of Chinook salmon. There was an early run in August, mid-August, and they were darker red fish. These were the Chilliwack summer reds. These were the transplanted fish from Slim Creek, Bowron Creek. And in fact, they had moved up beyond the hatchery and had used, moved into this very stable habitat that mimicked somewhat the habitats they were spawning in, in up in the interior. However, they spawned in mid-August, which is too early. Those fry will come out of the gravel in probably January, early February, and do very poorly. It's just not spring yet, particularly at this elevation. It's about 1,800 feet. So we don't think they're particularly viable. But there was a second group of fish, very small numbers, that showed up toward the last two weeks of September or very, very early in October. And these we suspected, talking to fisheries technicians out of the Chilliwack River hatchery, these we suspected were the original Scotskill Chinook. This is 1996 through 2000. So during that period, it was decided to look a little closer and we began monitoring other spawning grounds over that time between the Chilliwack River hatchery and the DFO stock assessment group. And over that time, a number of Chinook were recovered. And with the new genetic tools, 
uh, tissue samples were taken that indicated that these Chinook were not related to either of the hatchery populations in the Chilliwack River watershed. This confirmed that Scots Gazelle Chinook existed at least into the 2000s. Now, unfortunately, their numbers were low. They're very good at hiding. They have to hide for three or four months from other predators, and they're just as good at hiding from us. So the effort to monitor them was quite high, and the department had a lot of other priorities, and at some point, that effort ceased. Now, do we have samples in uh, archives? Yes, we do, but we don't have enough to, to confirm that they're a unique population, although every sample did show they were not related to the two hatchery populations. Anyway, this is a, a little challenge for the future. The population, the last time we looked uh, in, in the 2000s was there. The first time we looked seriously for them was when the Chilliwack hatchery was being built. And there was two stream technicians, Jim Donaldson and Pete Buck, were involved in those early, early surveys trying to find the Ch upper Chilliwack River Chinook. And they found them, but never quite enough to produce the number of eggs they needed for the new hatchery. And that's why that population was largely moved off of and these other populations brought into the watershed. But it didn't mean that they no longer existed. And Pete and Jim showed us in the 19, late 1990s and 2000s where they were, had seen them spawning in the late 1970s. And in fact, they were still there. So I suspect here in 2021, if we went looking for them in the exact same locations in the side channels below the Chilliwack Lake, the Scotskakal Chinook will be there. And I think that is a challenge for the future. These are genetic legacies from the past that we really need to take care of and pass forward to the future. So this is a restoration program project that I was involved with in the late 1990s. And this is the outlet of Chilliwack Lake. And you can get a sense there's a slightly lighter strip, a band across the outlet. That's all spawning gravel that was hauled down and placed there, primarily for steelhead, which spawn in this area quite heavily. But all the species that come into this part of the watershed have been seen coho, uh, chum salmon, or um, coho pink salmon, even a few chum salmon. We haven't observed Chinook salmon yet. But then again, they're very rare, but this is exactly where this Scutzkakal Chinook salmon would want to spawn. At the outlet of the lake, the gravel is very stable. The flows are very stable. The water quality is very high because of Chilliwack Lake. Again, an area worth monitoring in the future. From mid-September to early October, looking for these Chinook salmon that we hope are still there. Just some additional thoughts on where else these Chinook salmon might be found. In uh, above the Chilliwack Lake is the upper Chilliwack River, also known as Dolly Varden Creek, that flows for a short section through Canada in an ecological reserve. And most of its watershed is in the US of A in the North Cascades National Park. It is a beautiful, unlocked, undisturbed watershed, almost unique in the lower Fraser Valley, Stashkamu. And in that watershed, tens of thousands of sockeye spawn every year, typically in the latter portion of August. It is almost certain there will be Skutskakel Chinook in that river. However, no one has truly looked very hard for these fish or sampled them to ensure that they are the population we think they are and not strays from these other two hatchery populations that have been introduced only since the 1980s. So what does this mean? If you think about it, hatchery supported Ch Chinook populations in the Chilliwack River provide a lot of value to fisheries, uh, both angling and now First Nation fisheries. They are important to the watershed. But if you think in a longer term perspective, and think about how long Scutzkatel Chinook survived thousands of years in this watershed, that it is probably not a good long-term strategy 
to think that Chinook salmon always will exist in the Chilliwack River supported by hatcheries. Hatcheries are human constructs and we cannot predict the future. They may not always be there. So it is very reasonable to think that these fish, Scotskiskel Chinook, we should know where they are, approximately how many they are, and take whatever actions we need to do in future years and decades to ensure we pass them forward to the future generations because they truly are the genetic irreplaceable legacy of Chinook salmon in the Chilliwack River watershed. So this is the references, the various video links shown throughout the presentation. Uh, they're live in the PowerPoint presentation, if that's the one you're accessing. But in the YouTube version, they'll be in the description of the video at the front end. And you'll hopefully be able to have these live links there if you want to read these papers. There's three three scientific papers that I have put in the presentation on slide three. It's just talking about how Fraser River Chinook salmon are, are grouped together from genetic samples. But what's interesting for the Chilliwack River, they show two populations of Chinook, but they cluster with one, the Harrison River Chinook, and two, the Slim River, Bower and River Chinook in the upper Fraser. There's no mention of a Skutka Kale Chinook population in the Chilliwack River. And I'm hoping that in the future, this can be resolved by future work to find this population, see if it still exists and sample them and find where genetically they fit in terms of relatedness to other Fraser River Chinook populations. Uh, slide number 10, there's a, a link to a research paper on just how the Chilliwack River deglaciated. And that relates to the clay slides, which is often a, a major issue for salmon in the middle reaches of the Chilliwack River and for other users of the river. Slide 15 is a paper talking about what was benefit, what uh, numbers of fish came out of these restored channels and off-channel areas in the Chilliwack River including the Centennial Channel that I talked about. It's an interesting read. And just here on the last slide is a link to a story I wrote that describes my personal journey learning about salmon, the history of our beautiful place, the Lower Fraser River Valley, Stashkamut. And it focuses on a valley that I first visited as a very young person the upper Chilliwack River Valley, and I know of no other watershed in Skoshamut that is like this. It is a watershed largely untouched by the hands of man, where salmon, uh, forests, large old forests, and wildlife and people uh, would have experienced this throughout Skoshamut 200 years ago. So it's well worth a visit. It's a spiritual place, in my opinion where we can step back in time and think about what we've lost and what we need to do to protect what we have today and hopefully restore some of that that we have lost. Anyway, I hope you give it a read and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and it makes people think and think uh, about maybe how they might uh, have some influence on the future of looking deeper into the history of Scouts Cacao Chinook and find out if this population in fact does exist and how it's related to other populations in the Fraser River watershed. That's the challenge. And hopefully uh, good-hearted people will come together and try to take on that challenge in the future. We really need to protect these pieces of history that have been passed forward to us so we can protect them and pass for forward them to future generations.